Welcome everyone to our uh, third in this series of backcountry flying webinars. And on this one, we took just a unique twist. We thought we'd invite some friends that we know are really experienced backcountry pilots and focused on the East Coast. So a lot of times you hear backcountry flying and you think West Coast and you think mountains or you think um, the, the, you know, the middle of the U.S., the Central Mountains. But there's some really fun places to go on the East Coast that can, you can do some great backcountry flying. So uh, my guess are we're going to start tonight uh, after we do a short um, survey to see who's with us. Ian Twombly, who's uh, with AOPA Media, he wrote an article recently in an AOPA magazine about backcountry flying on the East Coast, which I tore that out, Ian, and put some copies in my desk drawer so when I have a free weekend or something, I can go circle a strip and go do it. And I've already hit a couple of them. And then Alan White, who's the REF state liaison for Maryland, Virginia, and West Virginia. I'm sure he's got some great uh, strips he's going to talk to us about. Doug Turnbull, who's with uh, the state of New York. And uh, Lou Furlong, a good friend uh, out of Georgia. And uh, Lou's working some technical difficulties. But Lou, we got you last, so we got a while to figure that out. And I'm Richard McSpadden with the AOPA Air Safety Institute. Um, own a Super Cub and I've done quite a bit of backcountry flying uh, all over the U.S. really. And so I'm really looking forward to tonight's uh, discussion. So, John, do we go right into the survey from here to see what kind of audience we have uh, for tonight? <laughs> All right. All right, bear with us. We're bringing the uh, survey questions up. <laughs> I can't see it, John. Is it launched yet? No. Yes, the audience okay. is seeing it. Uh... Okay, great. So the audience, uh, hopefully you guys are seeing a survey question in front of you. And um, what's your backcountry level of experience? Well, I always like to ask that so we know sort of the range of folks we're dealing with and usually we have people all over the all over the spectrum from people who want to to people who've done quite a bit of it so we'll start to build the answers as they come in all right we'll close that question Do we have John? I, I can't see that. Got about the thirty-two percent of you don't have any backcountry flying experience. So welcome. Hopefully this is a good introduction for you. If you'll find some place near to you that you can go to. Thirty-three uh, percent are I have uh, light experience. A couple of flights, maybe some short hops, uh, short trips. Twenty-four percent with moderate backcountry experience. Several trips into uh, several locations, and then eleven percent of you. Have done a lot of backcountry flying, so thanks for joining us. Appreciate that. We've got one more poll to watch here. What are your plans for this year? Do you have any interest in going into backcountry, or you trying to toy with a, exploring a strip or two, or you're definitely going? Good news, Richard, is that nobody's saying they don't want to go. Yeah, that's so good. That's, <laughs> well, that'd be okay too if they're just interested in this kind of flying and yeah. who does it and what kind of airplanes they do it in. And that's all good stuff. Seems just to feel for me, we'll talk to our uh, panelists as we come on, but just to feel for me is this uh, backcountry style and kind of flying seems to have been growing for several years now. And, and I, I don't think there's any end in sight to the appeal that it has to people. Coming up about the 82%, 83% of voters. We're going to go ahead and close the polls so we can get on into the meat of the topic. But let's share the results. About evenly split between toying with exploring a strip or two and 46% saying, yep, definitely going. And it 
hopefully it's this year. There's only a little bit of time left, but next year's always a year to go fly, and there's lots of great places to go fly that aren't winter bound. So our friends up in New York are getting slams. Well, there's always next year. All right. There's just a few that are. So let's, uh, let's carry on with uh, us. All right. Very good. So, um, Ian, why don't we hand it over to you now and talk about your article and sort of what inspired you to write it and uh, what you came across when you did. So welcome, Ian. Good to see you. Yeah. Thanks, Richard. I appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I think like a lot of people I've been watching as an observer, um, the explosion really of backcountry flying and uh, whether that's at events now and when it's on kind of a showcase or whether it's through our magazines or a website or whatever. So um, from a if you kind of take backcountry flying to its roots, I think, um, for me, there's a lot of, you know, when I was a kid, I got really interested in stories about people flying to Alaska and landing on the Alcan. And um, I went, as soon as I got interested in helicopters, I wanted, first thing I wanted to do was go land off airport somewhere. And so I've always had kind of a fascination with it. Um, but, you know, lived on the East Coast, right, uh, in Frederick. And so while the photos are incredible and you see, you know, in Montana and Idaho and all these amazing places, it didn't really, it, it felt a little foreign to me and a little inaccessible. And so um, I just got a little bit interested in this idea that that if you if you think about what backcountry is, it's, it's just a way to, I think, challenge your flying, um, fly to a few places maybe that we wouldn't necessarily think of, you know, maybe not 5,000 foot paved runways, um, and, uh, and to explore that in all, in, in the rest of the country. So that's why I call it, you know, backcountry for the rest of it for the rest of us. And, and primarily, I was thinking kind of east of the Mississippi. Um, the story, you know, I, I, I tried to take it from an event standpoint to give people a, a reason to go to these places. But um, I'm really especially to listen to the rest of the panelists because um, really the, the RAF has been uh, an incredible resource here. And, and uh, you know, their uh, directories and um, the work that the members have put together uh, to expand access all over the country is is just phenomenal. And so I um, was really excited to find that and to find some, you know, search through the AOPA guide and others. But, um, you know, I, I think we, we like to think of it, like I said, with these really challenging off airport or dog leg strips, that sort of thing. But um, I think if you, if you expand the definition a little bit and really think about what the flying is and, how it's often very social, you know, people fly in groups a lot of times, um, they fly to events, um, there's a lot, usually camping involved or staying in a lodge or something close by or maybe some fishing. And so um, if, you, if you think of it from kind of that standpoint and a little less from the, you know, super hard one way in, one way out kind of strips, there are really are opportunities all over the place. And so um, I'm, I'm excited to hear about some of those tonight. Yeah, me too. So uh, always, this is always a fun conversation. Um, so Alan, I'll start with you. If you just had to define somebody, if somebody asked you, like, what's, what is the backcountry? How do you define that? Well, the backcountry is, uh, to me, going into some place that is a little bit off the beaten path, that um, is not a paved runway. You know, after you've landed on a, you know, a few hundred uh, paved runways, they're pretty much all the same with a... Um, grass strip or an unpaved strip, uh, there's always difference to them. And then there's a little, there's challenges that go into that because you have to make certain with the pavement, you know what the condition is. So with a backcountry strip, uh, you, there's a little more uh, involvement in planning, going in there, checking it out. Uh, but the reward is fantastic because you see sites and um, experience, have experiences that you just don't get uh, at the regular big airports. And yeah. it doesn't have to be a, ter you know, a really difficult place to go into. There's lots of beautiful little grass strips in the Shenandoah Valley uh, and, and you know, all through the, the Atlantic states that uh, are just beautiful strips. And you go in there and kind of get away from everything. And um, it's so, so much and it's very enjoyable. And like you mentioned, social aspect, you know, fly with a friend or two and it really amps the enjoyment up. Doug, anything to add there on what you consider backcountry? You're on mute, Doug. You're on mute. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really interesting. Um, you know, backcountry is, is so many different things. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's fine and you know, going into a, a different airport can be, 
can be so challenging just because of the approaches and, and coming in and you know the winds and how they affect can be way different than anything you have at home. Um, and it's, it's looking at the runways, it's, it's you know, really paying attention to where the landing area is and where your departure area is and how uh, the wind will affect you. And it can really make a difference in, uh, in how you look at the, that particular airport, whether it's paved or, or grass or, or other. Yeah, I, I think of it as anywhere where there's not the normal infrastructure that we're used to, like wind socks and ASOS and, you know, controllers and, uh, you know, uh, approved approaches with elevation guides and all that stuff. You don't, you don't have any of that in backcountry. It's all left to your judgment to figure all that stuff out. And so, like, for example, I went into a strip on the Great River this, this past summer in Idaho. Uh, actually, it was in Wyoming. And... Um, that it was a paved runway, but it was a 2,500 foot, foot paved runway, one way in, and um, you know it had it had none of that. So it was a paved runway, but it was definitely in the backcountry. So um, I, that's the way that I think of it, which brings us to really, like you guys are saying, all over the place. This RAF airfield guide is a real is a great source. So um, Lou, do you want to talk to us about the REF airfield guide and have everybody chime in about what we can find on this guide and what kind of airfields are here? Sure, be happy to. Um, the airfield guide is actually a work in progress. Uh, there's over 300 airfields now in it and they're adding more every week. Uh, even though there's only five in the state of Georgia in the airfield guide, there's 159 other than asphalt runways in the state. Um, and just finding them is, is, you know, the key. But the airfield guide gives us a tremendous resource. Once you're in there and you get comfortable with it, um, it offers you all sorts of uh, options and in, intuition into what's going on at the airfield you want to go to. It's, it's, it's a great pre-briefing, just as if you had local knowledge and someone who had been there before you, you so you don't show up surprised. Um, and oftentimes there's pictures in there and there's diagrams oh. and descriptions about how to come into it. Just looking at it, the snapshot, um, Alan, what's the difference in the green and the uh, in the yellow that we see there? The green are permissive. That means you can go in there pretty much any time that you can get in there, um, day VFR, uh, obviously, but uh, no permission required. They're just welcoming. Come on in, we're glad to have you. Uh, the ones in yellow, they do want prior permission required, but they're very happy for you to come in. There's a reason that they want to, to, you to call them. There may be that it's on a river bottom and it's, it can be soft if it's rained. I've got one fellow that he's got dogs that like to chase airplanes. So he wants to make sure that his, his dogs are put up if you're coming in. Uh, there's uh, a couple on here that uh, you can come in any time except Sunday before 1 p.m. because they're right adjacent to churches. So, um, yeah, so, so they have, they may be prior permission required, but they are very open to you coming in. So the work has been done for you. Don't be afraid, you know, don't have the fear of rejection of calling up. Uh, they're going to, if there's any way possible, they're glad to have you come in. And I find that through most any uh, private airstrip. Uh, it, private airstrips are not uh, there with a link that says do not enter. Um, most uh, the owners are glad for you to come in if you just call them up and talk with them. I found that the same thing if you go on for flight or so if it's not in the guide and elsewhere if you just call them and explain who you are and what you fly and they'll usually have some logical questions like what kind of airplane do you fly? What's your experience level? And I found pretty high success rate of them saying yeah come on in and you know say hi when you do. Ian, did you use this guide uh, when you looked at your article and were picking out uh, places on the East Coast? I did, yeah, and it was fantastic. And um, I guess like Alan's saying, it's previously it would be, you know, I loved it. We're all curious, right? And we love maps. And so uh, you would take the sectional and you just, you know, search around and search around and see what looks, what might look like a good strip. And then I would go back in the old day to the FAA's 5010 web, which was essentially the airport database. And you go in and find the owner and a, and a phone number and, and you have to call them. And so um, this is such a quicker and more direct way to do it because it's obviously, as Alan was saying, sort of a pre-qualified places. And so you're not wasting your time just sort of randomly calling places that may or may not even still be open. So 
yeah, it's it's uh, it was a fantastic guy. I love it. So one of the questions here and I, that that I have is that when you go into a strip and you you have a, a feel for your own performance level, but you don't really know how that's going to stack up into some of these fields. So there's this idea of a relative hazard index. So Doug, can you talk to us a little bit about that relative hazard index and what is that? Yes, they've, they've come up with a RHI, the relative hazard index, and it takes in a lot of different aspects of it. Uh, uh, the, the runway, the length, uh, what obstructions uh, along the side of the runway, as well as the approaches in that. And many of the, the, uh, the dif different airports are non-standard approaches and departures. And that all ties into the RHI and gives it a, a value. And uh, it's it's really interesting to look at the airfield guide and, and the RHI and how it's laid out and it it will tell you where the hazards are in it. And also, um, if you look at the map, uh, each dot has a number in it. That is the RHI for that airport. The higher the number, the more difficult it is to get in. So you can kind of pick your comfort level just from looking at the map. Uh, I agree. Yeah. You know, if it's you know a six, that's pretty easy. If you got a 27 and you've never done one, you might want to go into the six first. Yeah, yeah. Or you know, the higher the number, it makes sense to either go in with somebody that's been in there before, or at a bare minimum, talk to somebody who's been in that field and say, why is this a rated a 15 or an 18 or whatever the case is. So that's that's good. That, go ahead. It's also that the pre-inspection of of a strip, of a landing zone, an inner strip. Uh, it's flying over it, fly it over both directions, look at it, and then take the information from the RHI to say, oh, that's why it, it is uh, at the hazard level that it is. All right, John, let's move on and um, next slide, please. So uh, Virginia, West Virginia, and Maryland, I think this is, is this you, Alan? Is this your? That's me. All right. So uh, there's lots of airports. We picked out a few that are just uh, really interesting to go into. The first one here is, is a public use airstrip, uh, Ingalls Hot Field uh, hot, in Hot Springs, Virginia. And um, it's the highest airport east of the Mississippi, 3,792 feet. Now, those of you out west may be laughing at us, but that's pretty high up here. And um, has a very long uh, paved runway with instrument approach. Uh, so you can go into there, but there is also, if you look uh, there, you can see on the picture, there is a perpendicular grass strip as well. It's about 2,000 feet, and uh, you can go in there and really test your metal at that strip. Um, you can go and land on that, and you know if you're not comfortable taking off with the density altitude that day on the grass strip, you can always take off on the long paved strip. Um, it has camping. There's two campgrounds complete with uh, picnic tables and fire rings. And uh, there's a couple of hiking trails that are there. And it's the elevation is such that you're above the light pollution. And so it's great on a clear night if you're camping out there uh, for stargazing. So it's it's a great place to go, a great starter field really to go in and, and uh, do your airplane camping or your flamping and um, great place to go to. The, Hazard index is six. It's based off of the long paved runway. The um, you do have to watch out. You know, you're on top of a mountain, so you're approaching over a cliff, and you can get you know a severe updraft or downdraft right at the end of those uh, runways as you're coming over there. So you want to be aware of that, and uh, maybe with that long runway, you can go in a little bit high just in case. Uh, but the grass strip is fantastic. They're actually it's not on the charts. You won't find the grass strip on the charts. It's, um, but but they're glad for you to land there and they keep it mowed. There is talk about uh, re um, making it a, a an actual runway. Um, we're in discussions with them now uh, about doing some uh, work there doing that. Awesome, good stuff. Yeah, I agree with you on that draft. I went in there in a, a bonanza for a twin Cessna convention last year, I think. And got a pretty good downdraft coming over that, uh, you know, right as you come in. I think it was runway seven there. Um, 
so like you said, like this and so many airports, there's no reason to put it on brick one, especially in most of the airplanes we fly in the back country, you know, you can, you can use that buffer underneath you just in case. So uh, yeah. what's next? I flew, what in, I flew in that same weekend for the Twin Cessna convention and was disappointed to find out none of the Twin Cessnas landed on the grass. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. All right, big deal. 44 Victor Alpha. Uh, it's n down near um, uh, Covington, Virginia, uh, in Eagle Rock. It is a beautiful strip. It's right on top of a, a small mountain. It looks intimidating as all heck when you're going in there. Uh, I love to take passengers into there because I show them that's the runway and they're, they're like, you've got to be kidding me. We're going to land on that. Um, but when you actually land, it's actually pr it's plenty long. It's Oh, I don't have it right off hand, but it's about close to 3,000 feet, I think. Um, but it's narrow and on top of that mountain, so it really looks small. But you land on there and you're going to end up taxiing half the distance up to the top. You go in a uh, uh, one um, runway, you land on 2 1, depart on 3, because there is quite a, a gradient. But that helps you with that landing, slows you down, gets you stopped. Um, and it is so dramatic. And taking off, is so dramatic because you're taking off and then all of a sudden you get above tree line and you just got mountains and valley all around you just you know all in, in, at once and it just pops right out at you it's a why is it a 15 why is it a 15 uh because of all the the, the trees the the narrowness of it um and uh yeah, I guess that's that's the main two reasons. Just an, it's you know it's not a real wide strip, and it's and 15 is not a real high score. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's still it's not you know your average. You know, if you have one that's a flat one that's you know 2,000 feet flat, no obstructions anywhere, it's going to be a six or seven or something like that. So this is a 15. It's not that you know it's like twice that. You mentioned you take passengers. What kind of Airplane do you fly in the back country, Alan? Well, I have a uh, Taylor Craft, but I also have a Beach Sundowner. And I have flown that Beach Sundowner into, well, all these strips and all the grass strips uh, that, that are going to be presented to, tonight that I, I have. And that's one of the other great things about the East is you don't need a super stole airport uh, airplane. You don't need big tires. Um, your regular Cessna 172 can handle most all these strips uh, with ease. Uh, there are exceptions, but for the most part, um, you know, that is one of the great advantages we have of not having the great altitude that they have out west. That um, we're we're good here. All right. What's what's next? Let's go to the next slide there. John's, John's coming. I caught him by surprise. <laughs> there, we go. there we go. Oh, Cheat River. Okay, this is in West Virginia. This You won't find it on the charts. You'll have to go to um, the airfield guide, or, or there is a, a um, funforpilots.com that uh, has a lot of the, has, has a lot more strips than the airfield guide, but it doesn't have near the in-depth coverage of, of the airfield guide. Um, but this is a privately owned strip. He's glad to have you come in basically all but one weekend a year. Uh, he has a family reunion he holds there one weekend a year. So he wants you to call if it's that weekend. He's going to say no. But other than that, he's glad for you to come in. He has three runways. Oh, that's my that's my Taylor Craft sitting there in that picture. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, the three runways on two sides of the river. It is obviously it's an on an island, or at least two of the runways are on the island. The, the other one's on the other side. There's a zip line. You can go across the river on the zip line. Um, you know, you're welcome to camp there. Uh, he's got uh, an outhouse. He's got uh, fire rings and firewood. And the approach into there is spectacular. You fly down the gorge, and then you have to make a substantial left-hand turn, sort of a very short left base. Um, turn there onto final and then land on the main runway. And um, there's a great fly in there twice a year that is heavily attended and just great place to fly into. I recommend, you know, once you have some experience, don't yeah. make this one your first one. I agree. I, I went in there 
this last fall for, I've been trying to go in here for three years and it, it got weathered out or something came up and I finally made it in there in the fall. And I would agree with them that it is a gorgeous place, right, right on the island, two strips on the island, one across the river. And I, I think that's a great assessment. I would not make this my first backcountry strip. You, you, you've got to know your airplane and know your skill level to get in there. And you see this one, the hazard index is 20. So you're getting up a, a lot higher here. Um, it's because the, the mountains are right there. Uh, you have a short turn to final uh, when you're landing. Um, you, you're coming over on the river. So if you land short, you're going to hit the, the bank. Uh, so, you know, there are, you know, quite a few hazards in this. But it's, you know, all said and done, once you're experienced, it's not that difficult if you have the experience in the right airplane. I would take my Sundowner in there. There's, I, I see, you know, there are um, beach uh, uh, Cherokees, I, I mean, beach Cherokee, Piper Cherokees uh, go in there, a lot of Cessna 172s. Um, you know, your average plane can go in there just fine. Yeah, I saw, saw a lot of RB8s and RB4s uh, in there on the plane he had. Right. Great. Yeah, that that's a to me that is a, just a definite on the on the must visit list if you're an East Coaster. Yeah, that's a bucket list one there. Yeah. Have you got any more? Yeah, well, sure. I can take all night, but yeah. <laughs> I figured you could. <laughs> well, so thanks for that overview, Alan. If people want to just ask you, we're we're going to open it up for some Q and A here in a bit. But um, people can reach out to you uh, if they want to talk more about uh, West Virginia, Virginia, and Maryland uh, backcountry flying. Certainly, yeah, I'm, um, and uh, you can find all three of us if you go to the RAF's website, uh, theraf.org, and uh, look under, you know, the personnel, um, and you can find all of us in there for our representative states, and uh, we have our email address there, and your, and I believe phone number's listed. We're glad to talk to, as you can tell, we're glad to talk to anybody about flying anytime. Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Alan. Doug, I'm excited to hear about this because I have not done much uh, backcountry flying in the Northeast and have been wanting to. So talk to us about some of your strips up there. Yeah, see. One of the strips is, is Carlin. It's uh, in New Hampshire, kind of southern New Hampshire. Uh, it's, it's quite a nice strip. Uh, you've got turf as, as well as a, uh, a paved runway. Um, and it gives you a lot of different opportunities to to try to try different things. Um, you know, there is some some hills and some hills, mountains in the area that you have to be aware of. Uh, there's, uh, you know, if you're taking off to the south, you've, you got to be kind of aware of uh, the, the the town and and what's going on in the town. Uh, they've they've got a you know camping area. They've got a, a spot for uh, uh, bicycles, so you can get bicycles and, and ride the bicycles into town. So there's a bunch of other activities there uh, at, at the airport. Awesome. Pretty low and, RHI there, as you, as, as kind of as you described, that was expected. Yeah, the, the uh, RI index uh, looks to be about a, a six. It's, um, no, I got that one wrong, sorry. Uh, but it's 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 really a pretty easy uh, airport to get get into and get out of. Um, the approaches into the grass, you've got to come down, you know, kind of in through a chute, uh, and it's pretty narrow and, and tight in the grass. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a it's a place you could really you know check things out and and, uh, and get a good feel for uh, some different experiences. Great. What what's next? From there, we've got Old Forge. It's up in the Adirondacks. Um, it's a private use strip, and they just want somebody to, you know, they just want you to call. That's that's really all it is. Uh, old Forge is a neat old um, back, you know, just an old town. Um, it's a great little place to go in. There's amusement park there. Uh, it's about a mile walk into town. A lot of different activities. Uh, it's a real tourist trap. The Old Forge hardware store is is a must must see place to to go into uh they've got some camping uh tie down areas um it's you know the the R, rhi index is is a six and it's basically just because of the, the trees um on the sides more than anything uh it's it's a big long very smooth runway uh very well maintained um 
it was very and it's kind of the the drop off into the adirondacks and there's lots to see up in in the adirondacks uh, so it's a it's a good drop off place jump off nice okay from there we're heading down to connecticut to the to good speed uh it's right on the edge of the the river um they've got paved and they also have a, a seaplane base so you know you could go in there with your amphib and and taxi on out or uh just you know straight floats uh it's it's a big open area uh and it's one of the you know kind of the premier northeast strips that the, the RA, RAF was able to to, to grab and uh, and help keep it keep it alive you know there was a at one point it was uh, destined to be bought up and and uh, turned into housing or, or something so the RAF has really helped uh, tie some uh, some people together you know get some interest to, to, to buy it and save it you know it's a it's a very uh, RHI is you know it's it's really quite low um but there's a lot of different opportunity for both wheels and and float people yeah. seems like a great place okay now we're going south to Lou's territory and so um lou i i, I forgot to ask doug what do you fly in the back country what kind of airplane I've got a PA-12 with 180 horse. Uh, I've been to Alaska twice, been out west uh, numerous times. Uh, I've got 31-inch bush wheels. Uh, I've learned a lot, both, you know, flying around here, but, you know, you get out west into the uh, Montana, Idaho, and then I've had some very interesting experiences when you get north into, into Alaska. And I'm uh, purchasing a Cessna 182 with a uh, 260 horse injected 470 and uh, sports in the stole kit so it'll it'll be my traveling plane but yet still be able to get into any of these strips that we're talking about um, it'll be a uh, just like the sundowner it, it'll get in and out of, of those places uh, without any trouble yeah fantastic well thanks for the overview of the northeast there i hope to be able to come up and visit a couple of those strips Lou, I know what you fly because you and I have flown together a lot. Most recently, you were showing me up at the Stoll demo down in uh, AOPA's uh, fly-in in Tampa, so uh, in your Skywagon. So talk to us about some of the places in Georgia and Tennessee. Well, um, we have a lot of strips down here that um, are easy to find if you've got a, a public use airport guide for Georgia or you just flying around. Um, I want to highlight two in particular, one in Georgia and one in Tennessee. Um, the first one is um, GA87. It's High Valley Air Park. It's called that because it's the highest elevation airport in Georgia at a, um, 2,807 feet, which is, uh, for those of us that go out west, it's kind of laughable. But uh, it's a wonderful place to hone your skill set especially because it's in a valley and it um, doesn't have a, a, a very high RHI. It's only six, has a few obstacles, as you can see on the north and south, but um, it's 2,000 feet long, 60 feet wide, um, drops off on both sides. It's kind of built up, but it drains very well. Um, it's changed hands a few times. It was originally built by an Eastern Airlines pilot probably 50 years ago. and. Uh, it has a restaurant on site that's open on the weekends, but the best thing is that it has camping and hot showers um, and bathrooms and cabins and actually homes nestled in the woods that you can rent. So as destinations go, uh, it's got everything. And it's um, those people that drive around that area may know it as the tail of the dragon. It's up by Suches. It's where North Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia all come together, uh, and it's it's a gem. They do want you to call in ahead of time just so they know you're coming, um, which is not a problem. And um, you can get weather from uh, an airport, Blairsville, which is only nine miles north. So the weather will be pretty accurate, I would say. Um, I I go up there all the time. I'm fortunate; it's 20 minutes from my house. In, in a sky wagon and we all know how fast they are 
but uh, so the other airport and um, there again just I can't state it enough that uh, when you go up here it's just like being in the back country so you don't have to go all the way out west to have an enjoyable time to me back country flying as I heard the rest of you talk about it um, it has to do with being able to, it's it's like going camping or for a hike with, and take your buddies along but you're using your airplane instead of hiking that to me is what it is it's just getting out one with nature um, as you can see the rhi here is is not terribly high but uh, you do have to be aware of all the mountains in the area that's for sure and there are no runway markings it's only 2,000 feet long so you know make sure you can hit your spot before you go up there uh, if you do have to go around there's some obstacles on the north and the south end and you want to be aware of those so uh, you know make sure you check your density altitude and things like that so now we can switch from that airport and go up into Tennessee and um, ALPA is very familiar with this airport in 2015 and 19 they held regional fly-ins there and they had you know um, over 600 um, I think there was something like 600 aircraft that attended each one of those it was it was a very big success but Tullahoma is the home of the beach museum they have two grass runways one alongside the north south runway you can see up on the left and then an east west runway which is part of the parish families um, little, they've got their own little airport but it's on site um, and um, you there is camping and i'm happy to say that very soon there will be showers available there for campers uh, the RAF has been working with the parish family to get that put in as along with some other things such as um, fire pits and whatnot. Um, those of you that um, want to go on a tour, uh, there's a uh, George Dickel and um, I think the other one is, uh, hmm, what is the other one? There, there's two or three. Um, Jack to, Daniels. Oh yeah, Jack Daniels and George Dickel. Jack Daniels. And, you can uh, go on a, a tour of, if you want to fly in there and stay in a hotel you can do that too or you can just fly in for the day um it's it's really really nice um i i go up there probably once every other month um so it, and it's a pretty flight up there um we have a particular airport that i wanted to just make a, just mention um it's not we don't have a slide for it um, it's down along the coast, just north of Jacksonville and south of Savannah, and it's called Creighton Island. Um, and it's a work in progress, but when it, when we, you know, bring it out, it's going to be spectacular, and I, I can't wait to share that with everybody. Um, it's it's like going back to the 17th century. I mean, there's just not much there. But anyway, um, that's, that's those are the two I wanted to highlight. The other yeah. airports we have in uh in georgia um uh, lots of grass but uh yeah, great just just get around and, and 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 go for a flight and 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 search them out yeah and i feel like uh from your article i mean there's so much to cover here on the east coast like there's a bunch of strips in north carolina that are fun to hit and south carolina has some certainly more in tennessee are there some of the ones that you wanted to pull out in your article that we haven't uh stressed here ian that you thought would be fun um yeah let me well let me just bring it up because um i think at, actually we've we've may have talked about a few of them um yeah. i think Creighton island actually uh we talked about um actually doug i wanted to ask you about there's a a small strip that i found i think it's on the guide um it's uh i'm going to mispronounce it but it's awasco uh in moravia New York, or have you been to that one? Are you familiar with it? Yes, uh, it, uh, <clears throat> it's uh, it's come up, and uh, uh, the fellow that owns that's trying to do a lot more um, promotion of the, of uh, the strip, and we were going to have a barbecue there, and and unfortunately, you had some tremendous rains that, that came in, but there's some camping, and uh, you know, it's it's quite a quite a nice trip in Alaska. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's uh, what co-located with an RV park or something like that. So yeah, yeah. We'll it at the northwest corner. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's good. And I mean, I I'm trying to remember. Should have had my logbook. You know, some of the places I used to go. But I mean, it, you guys have brought up some interesting ones that 
you know, we always think sort of grass or unimproved, but um, paved, I mean, there's all kinds of places like, you know, Stowe, Vermont is, it's, uh, it's a beautiful place to go into and it's, it, it can be challenging certainly in the winter um, and, uh, you know, in, in inclement weather. So there's, there's all kinds of cool places like that. There's uh, Katama out on the islands in Massachusetts. Um, and then, I don't know, Richard, you've, I know had a lot more experience recently around uh, Maryland and West Virginia and Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah, some of my favorites. I mean, we you can't talk East Coast backcountry and not talk Triple Tree, of course. So, mm -hmm. you know, fantastic uh, place. Now that one is a little more formal going in there. So you typically go in there when they have fly-ins, but the good news is they have a lot of fly-ins. So I want to say they probably have four a year. So I'm, I'm not, I could swear to that, but I yeah. think it's in that category. Um, and there's a- Well, they just added one. So they, did they have five now. They just okay. added one. Uh, and, yeah. and it's it's a gem, uh, you know, Richard. So and when you fly in there, they usually have it set up where they'll cook a breakfast and a dinner and you can sign up for it and you just make it easy. Um, and there's one called Breezewood uh, here in, um, I want to say it's probably actually in Pennsylvania. Um, Pennsylvania. Is it Pennsylvania? Yes. Yeah. And Wait, um, no, Greater, Greater Breezewood. Greater Breezewood, West yeah. Virginia. Greater Breezewood is West Virginia. Is it West Virginia? Okay, yeah. Um, a fantastic place to go in. A United Pilot owns it with his wife, and they're just really starting to build that out. They fun place. Um, so yeah, those are those are just a few. We really just wanted to give people a taste of some of the places on the East Coast and where you can go. I just want to spend just a little more before we open it to questions on this um, RHI index because. From a safety standpoint, what we've learned over and over again is the fewer surprises we have in a flight, the safer it tends to be and the better that flight tends to go for us and our passengers. And so what this RHI does is it helps you think through the kinds of things that you might see and that you might need to think about and plan for as you come in so you just, aren't, you just have fewer surprises when you show up about a stream or an uphill runway or trees on the approach end or whatever the case may be. So it's well worth your time when you're going in there to visit the site and pull out this RHI. It'll just help you think through the place you're about to go to. So but be John, careful. Well, be careful not to be over reliant on on that. Um, I went in just a few weeks ago to High Valley that Doug was just talking about, and it was a, a warm afternoon. And it shows there's trees down on, on both ends, and there are. And um, it, it, it was a little tighter than I would have liked coming out in my sundowner out of that strip. So, and it's only a six, I think. Is, it, is that correct, Doug? On the yeah. Right side? Yeah. So, uh, boy, that's the toughest six I've ever come out of in my life. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, it, you make a good point there, Alan, which is it's good but it sure is good when you can talk to somebody who's been in there before. And even better than that is follow somebody who's been in there before. So um, we, we've done that a lot in the, in the Mountain West uh, when I was learning the backcountry is flying behind people in my Super Cub and just having them talk through the approach they're flying and the speeds they're flying. In fact, Lou, you were one of the ones that when we flew out there that was helping us go through and learn these strips and how to get in and out of them. Just, just super beneficial to fly in with somebody who's done that. So yeah, uh, I, I encourage people to not go alone unless uh, unless you're the only one around. I mean, take somebody with you and um, four eyes are better than, than two anytime. Uh, just enjoy it and take, take a friend. We've got a few more minutes. So John, can we open it up for some questions for okay, our yeah, panelists here? Show just one slide. We talk a lot about events and there's many more that we haven't touched on. So. Just keep an eye on, on your event feeds, whether you get it through your social flight, through the AOPA website, through our emails, uh, through chat, chat room, stuff like that. Um, one last slide before we get to questions. You know, resources. Mm -hmm. Rich, you mentioned a few of them. Yeah. To start out with, the AOPA ASI Backcountry Resource Center is a good place to start. So. If you log in there, then we'll funnel you to the different sites that you may see in the different states and that have uh, resources for you to take a look at. We also have some tips on there and some guides and techniques on how to fly safely in the backcountry and the skills that you'll want to develop. So, uh, so take a look at that. And then um, we've mentioned the airfield guide and the RAF site's a great place to go. 
And then we learned tonight about the site that Alan mentioned, the fundforpilots.com is a place to go find uh, fun places to go into. Yeah, Richard, can I can I have just one more and something yeah. I've been using recently? And um, I'm I'm a Garmin Pilot user, and I know ForeFlight does. Um, you know, they'll I think they do uh, what Google Maps or something is overlaid. But in Garmin Pilot, in the terrain section of Pilot, you can demo, and then this is obviously going to be a lot more useful out west where you're flying mountain passes and stuff like that. But you can put in the aircraft's performance, climb performance, um, and actually 3D essentially fly the flight before you actually fly it um, to make sure that you're clear of terrain and you can see kind of what the departure path's gonna be and make sure that you've plotted the route carefully around the terrain as you need to. So I, I think that's an, just an incredible tool. It's really awesome. Yeah, great, good tip. Okay, John, what do we got for so, Q&A? Uh, first, first one we've got is, uh, and I think we may have answered this in a roundabout way, but um, uh, let's see. Uh, Tim says that he loves the idea of backup you fly, but he flies Cirrus. Uh, any options that are okay for our more fragile birds? I'm not sure I consider Cirrus fragile, but you know, Alan, you're taking a sundowner in there, and, and you've got some tail draggers going in. We've seen RVs go in. Can Cirri go in? Um, I'm not sure how, how uh, I've never flown a Cirrus. I'm not sure how long it would take him to, um, to stop. But you know, one thing we talked about, uh, you know, you've got like Bryce Resort in uh, Virginia that is a mountain airstrip down in the valley. It's, you know, you've got to weave your way in through the valley and land on, and it's a paved strip. And then you've got the restaurants, you've got the ski resorts, you've got a golf club, uh, a golf course. Um, there's mountain biking in the summer. So there's lots to do there. And that's a really nice um, backcountry strip that you can go into. Of course, we talked about Triple Tree. That's a 7,000 foot putting green. So you can go in there and take, you can take anything in there and yeah, uh, wouldn't jet, hesitate to go in there at all. I've jets land on Triple Tree. Um, but yeah, I think the big issue for them him to worry about is just the, just the nose gear and the stoutness of the nose gear. And, you know, oftentimes offside the runway, the areas aren't prepared or not walked. So you, you, that's, that's, you have to really use a lot of judgment there. And sometimes even the runways themselves can have gopher holes and things. So that, I don't know about you guys, but that would be my, you can't, I mean, certainly I've seen a lot of Cessna 182s in the back country. I've seen a Navion in the back country, Bonanzas. So there are definitely some strips, even in the Mountain West, that you can take those airplanes into. You just have to really be careful and make sure you talk to people about it. Yeah, Bear River in uh, so, Virginia, Victor Golf 54 is a very good uh, starter field. It's 2,000 feet, very flat, very smooth, beautiful strip. So look that one up. Yeah, great. Um, I just wanted to make one comment about the Cirrus. Um, the POH will have a wealth of information. I have just a little bit of time in one, but it's a laminar flow wing and it's not a real high lift wing and it doesn't get, it, it doesn't generate a lot of Bernoulli's until it gets up some speed. So um, climb gradients are, are always to be taken into consideration when we go into anything that is confined or has trees and, and obstacles around it. But uh, that doesn't mean you can't do it, but the POH will tell you an awful lot. Yeah, that's a really good point. All right, John, what else we got? So uh, good question from John here. Uh, I know he's out in Washington State. Are the, num are the number of relatively inexpensive backcountry capable aircraft declining as our GA fleet erodes with time? How does the panel view the future for affordable aircraft that are backcountry capable? Anybody want to start off with that there's, one? Um, airplanes, the availability well, of backcountry. I would say that there's so many airplanes that are backcountry capable that just look in your hangar, you might have it right now. We talked about 172s and 182s and any, you know, a Taylor craft like Alan's got, uh, you know, they're backcountry capable. They don't have to have a lot of horsepower. You've just got to operate them within their, their limits. But, uh, uh, you'd be surprised. I'm, I don't. I, I don't think that there's going to be a shortage of capable airplanes. What we need to do is make sure that the, we're capable. Mm -hmm. The airplane is there, but are we going to be capable? And can we operate it? And can you? The old can you hit your spot? Well, it's you. It's not the airplane. So there's lots of airplanes out there that are ready and willing and ready to take you into the backcountry. 
Um, yeah, I would I would absolutely agree, Lou. Um, it's it's the, the the planes are there. It's the pilot get the pilot to learn how to fly the plane and learn learn how to fly, learn how to land it. You know, hit your spot, uh, understand your your speeds. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Here yeah, you don't really need the big big wheels and uh, you know the super engine to get you out of the high density altitude areas. You know there are a lot more planes like they were saying that are capable of handling the strips in the east. And yes, you know like I fly the Sundowner into you know tons of them. Uh, it's like I said, you just got to know your plane and know your capabilities. But the prices good. are going up. There's also <laughs> some good airplanes coming in the market like the kit boxes and. Uh, you know that that style of airplane that are a lot of fun uh, to take in the backcountry and very capable. Very. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I know we I know we talked about a a, a long seven thousand foot putting green grass you know grass strip, but uh, Valerie wants to know besides that one, are there any others that are you know forty five hundred feet or longer in our list mm -hmm. in the uh, airfield guide or? What did, did you guys hear that? The question is, are there strips that are 4,500 feet or longer? Hmm. Well, there's one 4,000 feet Blackwater, you know, uh, but it's it's in northern Florida in the Panhandle. Um, I'd have to look. Chico, 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 in western New York is, that's a pretty long piece of grass, isn't it? Which, which one, Ian? Geneseo in western New York. I, yeah, I think that's 4,500 or so. Um, the old forge is smooth and, and wide at 3,200 feet uh, grass. Um, There's a beautiful strip uh, down in Florida. Um, I think it's just north of Wellington, Florida in uh, Indian River, I think. Um, it's, I want to say it's probably 6,000 feet long grass strip. Just beautiful place. You're not thinking of Leeward Air Ranch, are you? No, it's it's that's, that's, Indian River or Indian Springs or something to that effect. Yeah. No. Uh, all right. What else we got, John? So uh, there was a comment. Steve made a comment that uh, talking about the RHI, and important to remember that it was used in uh, the airfield guys. The same one that was developed by Galen uh, Hanselman for his books, uh, flying in Idaho and some of the other areas. Um, and he mentioned that it tends to be more applicable for mountainous, high density altitude areas. But the question that I want to kind of ask with this came from Eric. In addition to environmental factors such as terrain and service conditions, et cetera, what aircraft performance was used to determine RHI, or was aircraft performance used to help determine that number? So first, I want to comment on uh, Steve's comments. A good one that 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 RHI came from uh, Galen Hansen, and that was that's really the foundation of it, and that it was developed more for that and took took all that. So that's something for us to consider. But uh, based on John's question, guys, do you do you know if if there was any particular aircraft performance that was in mind when the RHI was built? I don't think so because if I look at the factors, the factors in there aren't so much aircraft performance based. It's more of the environmental or sort of terrain factors that any airplane has to take into consideration, right? Well, you can actually put your own um, numbers in there and uh, it will show you, you know, your um, departure gradient and everything from your own airplane and are you going to clear it so you can put your own performance numbers in there and um, into that uh, RHI uh, page and determine for yourself uh, one thing was brought up a uh, Klein kill in New York's 4,000 feet okay is there an, do you have the identifier for that or does it have an identifier uh, Lou <laughs> let's see I've got it right here so oh, New York one uh, November Yankee one okay <clears throat> And Geneseo is 4,700 feet, and that's the National Warbird Museum is is at that uh, that strip. Okay, here we go, Lawson Lowry. Hey, Lawson, thanks for thanks for joining. I know him. He's a Navion guy. He says, uh, "I have a Navion. Could I go to Crayon Island in my Navion? Any other reasons not to use Navion for some of these strips?" So I know a little bit about the Navion, so I'll talk about that. The good thing about Navion, I've been to several places where I've thought to myself, I could easily fly a Navion in here. It's got good power and they have really stout landing gear. So um, that's 
that's a good news. <laughs> what do you think, Cray and Cray and Island? Um, Doug, could they could a Navy on going? I, I'm not familiar with that strip. It, it, uh, Creighton Island be one for Lou to answer on that one. Creighton Island, I'm sorry, in South Carolina. Oh, they were talking about Creighton. Yeah, um, that's uh, that's the one. It's in South Georgia. Yeah, Creighton's only about 1,800 feet long. He's taken his Navy on in there. He said, or he wants to go in there. He's asking if he could. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'd have to defer to you, Sad, yeah, on an 1,800 yeah, foot say, runway uh, with obstacles. Yeah, it kind of depends on performance, and I'm not sure. I think he's got the big engine. I think he's got the the 520 or the 550 in that one, which would be fine um, from a performance standpoint. So I don't know anything about the strip, so I, I'm sorry we can't answer that one directly. A uh, lot, but I'll 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 talk to you about that one offline. We can look at it. So one quick question: Creighton Island is in um, is in the RAF in, in the guide in the airfield guide. And he can go in there and put his airplane in, uh, like Alan was talking about. He can he can put his performance specs in, what his approach speed is going to be, what his his departure speed is going to be, and what gradient he wants. And he can pretty much work his airplane on paper and see if it's a fit or not. Great. All right, John. What else we got? Uh, this is a, a good question. In this tough insurance market, have y'all encountered any additional requirements for operating in unimproved it calls it land outs? So off, off. No. Or, or I've not. No. Okay. No. No. Every now and then, I've heard of a policy that will uh, have in there that you're not allowed to land on anything other than pavement. Every now and then, somebody's talked to me about that piece that's in their policy. But it's usually on aircraft that you, know, you, you wouldn't necessarily see in the back country. But do it anyway, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah good point. There's a question that was asked earlier. Um, somebody who's planning a, a cross country trip, she's got pets, dogs specifically, um, are in general, and I realize you're probably going to have to contact each particular field for this, but in general, are the private use airports uh, amenable to dogs coming along on a flight? Yes, I, I wouldn't think, you know, as long as you got them on a leash, I don't think there would be uh, much of a problem. But, you know, uh, uh, those that are open, um, I don't think there would be any problem at all. Those that uh, do ask for prior permission, um, you know, I'd mentioned that I've got a dog, but I don't, typically that's not going to be a problem as long as they're on a leash. So here's a question about amphibs. Uh, are amphib aircraft uh, in the backcountry okay? Well, I was in the backcountry this past summer, um, and uh, we had a, um, a caravan on amphibs land in a nine quarter circle, which is about 65,000 feet, um, about 4,000 feet of grass runway. So I've seen them, but you just got to, again, be really careful about the condition of the strip and your climb gradients and the kind of engine and all that stuff. You just have to be extra careful about that. Let's see. Do you see many RV-12s on grass strips? Um, yeah, well, our RV-12s here, we have a couple at AOPA, and we've landed them on grass strips around here, Nice, nicer grass strips that we know are in good condition. So that, I, would, I would watch the RV-12s nose gear. It's not that sturdy. Um, and prop clearance, those, those are the two things that I'd watch. So I'd just make sure of the status of the, the field itself, the runway and the taxiways before I took an RB12 off, off there. Uh, let's see. Oh, here, here's a really good observation. I'd love to get you guys' thoughts on this. Um, one thing that seems never to be considered in RHI calculations is location of the sun late and early in the day. It's a really good point, I think. I've landed where the sun was, you know, on top and blinding me, both going out and coming back. I bet all of us have had that happen before. You guys want to address that? There have been yeah, times. It's, when it's real. Yeah. Yeah. There have been times when I've uh, aborted a going into a strip because I just couldn't see it well enough because of the sun. That, that's a really good point that it's often overlooked until it's too late. I, I can speak for myself. I've been in that position where you're like, hmm. We should have thought through the sun angle a little more. And, and sometimes it's, you know, uh, the, the best 
best way to land may be you know a couple mile an hour downwind because you can see and again it, it comes down to understanding your plane understanding the numbers and uh, you know practice that in a different environment as opposed to you know some tight uh, landing area you know and go in with a friend and you know like don't be surprised about those those type of things yeah all right here we go with the lou furlong fan club already starting up i would like to get in touch with lou i have two possible strips to in tennessee to consider Lou, how do you want us to uh, address that uh sure um i'll uh he can email me uh, uh i whatever you want um, if you get his email and then share it with me that would be the best and i'll reach out to him okay john collins is giving me a big thumbs up so that's what we'll do okay and i'm from tennessee i'm in the state quite often i'm glad to help i, I was going to say yeah i'm i was going to mention i need to talk to alan about this <laughs> <laughs> i fly the big orange bird i'm a tennessee fellow all the way so i saw the checkerboard on that wing of that one picture you saw there mm -hmm. so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's... I've got a question I'm going to ask because it's kind of a hometown question for me. And Doug, this is for you. Are there any airports around the Niagara Falls area? I grew up in Lewiston. Valerie wants to know are there any airports around the Niagara Falls area that would qualify as a backcountry airport? I want to say, if I remember correctly, Holland International up uh, just south of Lake Ontario in uh, Cambria, I think. Perhaps, maybe. Yeah, um, there, there's a couple. There's, there's one um, uh, that's covered up. Uh, Sheer, which is a private, uh, which do, they do a bunch of skydiving out of it. Uh, Clarence Aerodome, yeah, it's a grass strip, uh, 2,500 feet. You know, Holland International again, it's 2,900. So there's, there's some grass strips right in that area. Um, that, uh, would be. Could be challenging as well as some uh, some private you could call and and, uh, and see about getting in. Well, we've gone over our time, so I just want to thank our panelists here for joining us and providing their expertise and being willing to first volunteer and with the RAF to help keep these great strips open. So thanks for the work that you do there with the RAF and helping us to have access to these beautiful places. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, any other any closing comments? We'll I'll go around the horn. Ian, any uh, closing thoughts or comments from you? Other than we should come down to Costa Rica your way. I bet there's some backcountry flying down there. Yeah, that's yeah. Well, that's why I was saying that. You know, the uh, certainly with Garmin Pilot in the terrain. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's. Uh, I would say just you know expand your expand your horizons about what you consider the backcountry and um, and you know pavement is always pavement but grass isn't always grass and everyone is different and everyone is a, is a new flight so just have fun and good be creative that's i always like to uh my friend uh which all of us here know mike vivian always says um if it looks rough it is if it looks smooth it might be so <laughs> it's a great thing to keep in mind alan yeah. closing thoughts from you tonight I mean, another source of information is is YouTube. You can always get on there, and uh, there's lots of um, videos of people going into a lot of these strips. So if you have uh, a strip in mind you want to go into, search and see if you can find a video on it and someone going in there. It will tell you a lot. Doug, uh, practice, uh, learn your learn your aircraft. Uh, you know, uh, go to a go to your your longer runway and practice hitting your your landing spot uh, you know find somebody uh, another pilot that, that has experience and get with them and learn from them i i heard to piggyback on that i heard mark Patey talk about this one time he's done a lot of different kind of flying including in the backcountry he said when he hadn't flown in a while to prepare he'll go out and fly 10 landings and right. where he considers his uh, capability is the worst of the 10 landings not the average the worst of the 10. That's what he's ready to go into. And I thought that was an excellent. Actually, I think he adds some to that worst of the. Um, yeah, I, of, I think you might be right. He takes that and then he, he fudges even that a little bit. Yeah. Or something. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah. All right. And, and Lou. Well, I want to expound just for a second on what Alan said uh, about all the resources on YouTube. There's a gentleman there by the name of Patrick Romano who has a wonderful set of. Uh, technique and instructional videos on slowing your airplane down. In fact, when Spad and I did that 
stole demo down in Tampa. I'm not a stole pilot, but I wanted to, I went in and re reread his, uh, and excuse me, I, I watched his videos and to get myself tuned up. Uh, so there's lots of resources out there if you want to, if you want to look for them. What was but, the name uh, thank again? you for having us. What was that name again? Patrick Luke? Romano. Yeah. Patrick Romano, R O M A N O. I think he's out of Colorado. Yeah. Isn't he out of Colorado? He is, yeah. And he also has his videos are on backcountrypilot.org uh, okay. as well. That's another good resource. And supercub.org, we all know that one. Yeah. A tremendous uh, yeah. on there. And that's, that's, that's my favorite. Yeah, I think that's one of the best sites on the web for pilots is supercub.org. All right, great. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I hope to get the chance to go flying with all of you in these different regions. And uh, thanks for joining us. Come on down. Thank you. Thanks for logging thank in and uh, get out in the backcountry. We'll see you out there. Take a friend flying. Wings, folks, this is a, a seminar, a webinar for Wings. So if you signed up with your Wings account, email, fantastic. If you didn't or you don't remember if you did, submit it to us via questions or you can send it to us at safety at AOPA.org. We'll be happy to add you to our list. Also, if you're using the AOPA Pilot Passport, part of the AOPA app, your webinar badge for tonight, uh, the code is ASIWeb11. 1722 that gives you a cool little badge icon and a thousand points. The uh, the screen is showing you a series of, plot of uh, sh uh, screenshots so you can click into either the index or the uh, icon and navigate down to Pilot Passport, My Pilot Passport, and then you'll get to My Points and Badges. At the very bottom of that page, it will say Affiliate, uh, enter or redeem affiliate code, click on that or tap on that, and then when that Redeem Affiliate Code page pops up, right where you see item number five, go ahead and enter in ASI Web 111722. That will expire in a couple of weeks. And uh, that's because we've got another webinar coming up in December. Richard and the AOPA ASI management staff is going to take a look at how we did in 2022 yep. with our safety. Yep. And uh, go from there. Also, uh, you, should, you saw the slide for Husky Aircraft. Just want to thank them for sponsoring this series of webinars. If you'd like to get a transcript credit on your ASI transcript, you can go to this link, bit.ly slash bcrewards3 cert, and you can pick that up, and that'll be in your ASI transcript. As always, our, our work is funded primarily through the AOPA Foundation, the generous donations from pilots and aviation enthusiasts around the world, and particularly in the U.S. If you feel so so uh, so led to, to donate, you can go to aopafoundation.org, and there's a donate button to click there. Of different ways you can donate and contribute to our mission. And finally. Hopefully you're an AOPA member. We'd really like to have you if you aren't one. So if you aren't, please go to aopa.org slash join today and you can join the nation's, the world's largest general aviation organization. Become part of our wonderful community and enjoy all the benefits of being an AOPA member. Uh, the magazines that Ian writes for, the content we have on our web, the stuff that ASI puts together, it's all there on our website. It's getting updated and redone every day so you can see more and more information. And we just like to say again, Thank you for joining us and have a good evening. Everybody fly safe. <laughs>